Ashley and Lange. Um, we just heard an excellent uh, colloquium by a former uh, IPC postdoc. She's sitting somewhere. Uh, we know that he exists because he generated. Uh, Did I generate a lot of gravitational force? Yes. <laughs> so we call him uh, uh, Professor X from Caltech. Um, and uh, we hear more from Constantine Batig in, uh, uh, in a few minutes. Um, we start with the news on, on planets around stars, uh, nearby stars, uh, one being that, uh, of course, the sun that we have been talking about. And then uh, Laura Kreiper, who is a new Harvard Society uh, fellow that just arrived a couple of months ago, managed to write a paper within the same week that she arrived, <laughs> right? Um, um, because at the time uh, there was an announcement of a planet next to Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star to Earth, about a parsec away. Uh, uh, in the habitable zone, a planet that is only about 30% more massive than the Earth. Uh, and perhaps it's a place to move to after the sun will die. This, and this star is much longer lived than the sun, for a thousand times longer. Uh, so Laura will discuss the prospects of characterizing the atmosphere of Proxima B with uh, JWST, which is the question that anyone that wants to travel there uh, asks, uh, what, what is the atmosphere like? Um, and then we'll hear from Constantine uh, about the origins of extrasolar orbital distribution. And uh, after that we'll hear from uh, Matt McQueen, uh, who is not, uh, a former student of our uh, Astronomy department that is getting the book uh, prize today uh, and giving the CFA colloquium. He's uh, a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, I'm not sure my talk over there. Uh, and Matt will tell us about understanding cosmological perturbation theory for large scale structure in one dimension. Uh, usually, uh, the fashion is to go to more extra dimensions, but you are reducing the It's very beautiful in one dimension. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we'll hear from uh, a visitor, Sherwin uh, Laporte, who is visiting from Columbia, and will tell us about the response of the Milky Way disk to the large Magellanic cloud. All right, thanks, Sally. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't know if you can So I will say I am not a theorist, and I'm an observer, but I wrote a theory paper in my first week here with Avi, and I'm, I'm also not in the habit of writing papers in a week, but this discovery was so exciting that I was um, really motivated to write something right at the very beginning. Um, so unless you've been hiding under a rock, you've all heard about the discovery of Proxima b. Um, and this planet is a 1.3 Earth mass, or minimum mass, planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, which is just one parsec away from us. Um, the equilibrium temperature of the planet is about 235 Kelvin, which is within 20 degrees of Earth's equilibrium temperature. And so the question we're all asking is, is this planet actually an Earth twin? And based on these two facts alone, the answer seems to be yes. It's about the same mass. It's about the same temperature. A uh, complication, however, is that the orbital period of the planet is only 11 days. Um, and this is because the temperature of Proxima is about 3,000 Kelvin, and so the habitable zone of the star is very close in. So there's a number of red flags associated with this. Um, M dwarfs are very different from sun like stars. They're extremely bright in the UV in their early lifetimes, and it takes them longer to reach the main sequence than a sun like star. Um, so, this very, very bright and long early UV phase can contribute to atmospheric escape for planets that are on short orbital periods. The planet is also closer to the star, and so flaring and uh, stellar winds can contribute to atmospheric erosion of the planet, and, and, and the, the biggest one in my mind is that the planet is expected, be, to, expected to be tidally locked on such a short orbital period. And in that case, you can end up with a situation where your atmosphere freezes out on the night side of the planet, and so you get kind of a snow cone situation with a rock on one side and ice on the other. And so all of these questions, all, all these, these problems make us wonder whether an atmosphere has been able to survive on this planet or not. And 
I'm impatient, and so I was trying to figure out the first, the, like, what is the first thing we can do to study this planet's atmosphere? And fortunately for us, JWST is scheduled to launch in just a couple years. And one of the things that JWST will be able to do is measure very precise thermal phase curves. It can operate far enough into the infrared where the planet to star contrast ratio becomes favorable enough that we can start to see thermal emission from the planet. Um, and just a, a little schematic of how this works, this cartoon shows what a tidally locked planet um, should look like if you're measuring the sum total flux from the planet plus the star. And so you can see as the day side of the planet, which is hotter, rotates into view, you get a rise in total flux. And then as the planet is eclipsed by the star, you get a dip um, here, and then the planet rotates back out of view. And unfortunately for us, Proxima b does not appear to be transiting its host star. There was a search done with the most space telescope um, that did not reveal any transits, although there's a false negative probability of about 30% in those observations. It's very challenging uh, to do this. And um, in addition to that, the transit probability is about 1%, so we don't expect this thing to be transiting. However, um, we can still measure the thermal variation and learn quite a bit about the planet, as I'll discuss next. Okay, so for the paper Avi and I wrote, we built a, a very simple toy climate model for the planet, which is just based on the amount of energy that is redistributed from the day side to the night side. So the idea is that in the simplest possible case of no atmosphere, all of the light from the star is absorbed on the day side and will re-radiate as a black body. Um, and so that's shown with the red curve here. Um, this is temperature as a function of angular separation from the substellar point. And so the temperature will drop as you get farther and farther away from the substellar point because the effective area of the planet available to absorb the incident flux decreases. And then in the, the opposite limiting case of half of the energy being redistributed to the night side, we chose a model where the temperature was isothermal, so the same everywhere. And so this parameter F is just the fraction of um, incident flux that is redistributed to the night side. And we looked at two cases. One of them is the case of uh, zero or yeah, zero redistrib redistribution to the night side. That's what we would expect from a bare rocky surface. Um, and here's the expected phase variation at different wavelengths. So you can see as you go to longer wavelengths, so this is 10 microns here, the signal goes up because the planet to star contrast ratio is more favorable. On the flip side, if you have roughly a third of your energy redistributed to the night side, the amplitude of the phase variation goes down because the temperature contrast between the day side and the night side is lower. And I should add that I made these models with Spider-Man, which is an open source code developed by a student I supervised last summer. Um, it's available on GitHub and in papers and prep. And what this code will do is take any input temperature distribution for your planet and produce a phase curve. Okay, so the million dollar question is, can we actually detect uh, these differences? And the short answer is yes. So um, very excitingly, the exposure time calculator for JWST is now available, which more than anything else made it like real to me that the telescope is going to launch soon. Um, so I simulated some observations with the MIRI instrument. Um, and so between five and 12 microns, this is spectroscopy with the LRS instrument. And then these data points, redder than 12 microns, are all photometry. And the way I calculated these is I looked at the difference in um, the planet brightness on a one-day bin, averaged on the day side, subtracted from the night side. And you can see that you can very clearly distinguish between a bare rocky surface and a case with moderate heat redistribution. Oh, and I, sh I should also add that this 35% this redistribution is not totally arbitrary. It's informed by a more detailed GCM modeling of the planet's climate, which suggests that if you have a substantial atmosphere or an ocean, you can very easily redistribute that much energy to the night side.
And so I also did a little mock retrieval showing how well we can actually get back the model parameters that we use to describe the planet's atmosphere. And we do a pretty good job. Um, so this is based on the LRS observations alone. So just the spectroscopy here between 5 and 12 microns. Um, and you can see that, um, so three parameters I'm including are the planet <coughs> radius, which I'll talk more about in a second, um, the albedo, so how reflective the planet is, and how much of the energy is redistributed. So the inputs were an albedo of 0.1 and a redistribution of zero. So this is assuming a rock case. And we can differentiate between a bare rock's heat redistribution versus 35% and about four or five sigma confidence with a single phase curve observation. So that's very powerful. Um, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the feasibility of doing this because this is because I truly am an observer, not a theorist. So I wanted to see whether we can actually make this observation for real. Um, but I want one more comment while I'm in theory land, which is the idea of potentially detecting the um, 9.8 micron ozone feature in the planet's atmosphere. So supposing uh, we did not detect strong thermal phase variation from the planet, that would be indicative that it does have some sort of atmosphere. And we were wondering whether you could, in principle, detect ozone absorption. Um, there's a, a, an ozone absorption band right around 9.8 microns. And this is what it would look like if you co-added about two months of <laughs> LRS spectroscopy. Um, and you can see that the amplitude of the feature is about one part per million. This, in you know, it would be amazing if we detected this. I personally would not propose for 60 days of JWST time right off the bat to do this. Um, so, yeah, so I, I want to talk a little bit about assumptions and caveats because I, I am very excited about doing this and I want to make sure that it'll work. And so the, the three biggest caveats, I would say, are that in these calculations, I've assumed that the planet and the star are perfect black bodies. This is not the case for either. Um, in particular, the star is not a perfect black body. How much time do I have? Zero. <laughs> it's, okay. The, all right. In that case, I will skip to my last, um, the, the, the most important assumption, I think, which is that the um, observations are photon limited. And this, we've, we've done a good job at reaching the photon limit with Spitzer and with HST. The dominant instrument systematic is probably for, for um, MIRI going to be that the pixels don't have uniform sensitivity. And so as the very, very minor changes in the pointing of the telescope result in the star being put on more or less sensitive regions of the pixel. Um, but with Spitzer, we've been tremendously successful at um, mapping out the sensitivity function. And we've used this to reach um, <coughs> precision that allows us to detect thermal phase variation of order 200 parts per million. This is for the super Earth 55 Cancri E. And so given that JWST will be much better pointed, much um, with a modern suite of instrumentation, and we have this whole history of, of developing statistical techniques for correcting these instrument systematics, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to make such a measurement for Proxima B. So I'll say stay tuned. It's going to be awesome. And I'll take questions. Yeah, so the, I calculated the tidal locking time scale, and it's about 10,000 years, so fairly confident. Uh, it's possible if you had something like a moon that that could change the locking time scale, but moons are not considered to be stable um, in the habitable zone of stars this, um, of this mass.
Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, I want to talk a little bit about exoplanets. I already talked about uh, planets in the solar system that uh, we can't see. Uh, no, I want to talk about some, some planets that we can actually see. Um, so, at this point, it's pretty clear that most planets form in protoplanetary disks, because many of them have hydrogen helium envelopes that they acquire in their disks, and when Planets form in disks, they raise spiral density waves that back react onto the planets and cause the planets to move around, so they migrate. Before the advent of data that uh, Kepler has given us, the expectations of what the typical architecture of planetary systems close to their star would look like was very clear, right? As these planets all migrate convergently towards their host star, they should theoretically all lock into mean motion resonances, these uh, special configurations where the period ratios can be roughly expressed as a uh, sequence of two uh, consequent integers. Um, so the models, the theoretical models of disk plus lots of planets typically give you at the end of the day something that looks like the Galilean uh, satellite system. And indeed, such exoplanets exist. Gliese 8.7.6 is a good example of a resonant exoplanetary system, right, where there are also planets C, B, and E are trapped in a uh, uh, Laplace-type resonance. But this turns out to be more of an exception than the norm. If we plot period ratio of extrasolar planets um, with well-determined masses as a function of the total planetary mass scaled by the stellar mass, it looks like somebody took a machine gun and just shot the plot, right? It's not true that most planets line up on resonant lines, right? So something is missing in our understanding of planet formation theory, and I would like to understand what it is. I'm not the first person to point this out. There are some ideas floating around the literature. The three uh, kind of most prominent ideas are that Resonances are simply metastable in disks. They don't last very long. Idea number two is that turbulent fluctuations in the disk will create a random component of the gravitational field which will bounce planets around. They will eventually break resonance. And the final idea is that maybe our expectation that everything should lock into resonance is, uh, is not so kosher. So I will start out by saying that the resonant metastability hypothesis requires that the outer planet must be much more massive than the inner planet for this to work. That is not reflected in the data, so I don't think that's the answer. It's, physic it's theoretically sound, but I just don't think the data supports it. What about this turbulent, um, the notion that turbulence can uh, prevent resonant locking? This is actually an idea that Fred Adams uh, published before the data, so he should get some credit for um, you know, seeing what the answer might be despite the large-scale expectation of uh, resonances. Problem is it's, it's difficult to model, right? It's difficult to do calculations of, of planets and turbulent disks and blah, 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 and, you know, really get a feeling for, for how the scaling relationships will work. The good news is you can more or less uh, solve it analytically, as it turns out. You can treat turbulent fluctuations in the disk is effectively white noise with a diffusion coefficient that depends on the disk alpha, the viscosity, as well as uh, the normalized disk mass. You can, you know, it's been known since uh, before Kurt Cobain committed suicide that, you know, uh, planets can migrate towards one another on a characteristic time scale, which is relatively well determined. And finally, we actually have a 
uh, well-developed understanding of, of how the elliptic, unrestricted three-body problem behaves in the resonant regime. So you can do a calculation where you can effectively, I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but you can effectively compute the width of the distribution function of your period ratio, which is wide because it's turbulently forced and it is limited by convergent migration, it's kind of realigning. Compare that with the width of resonance to deduce an analytic criterion that explosion of confetti was supposed to represent math. Um, <laughs> Right, you can deduce sort of an analytic criterion for uh, turbulent breaking of resonance. That's what we did, and you know it has all the cool, all the right things in there, like disk alpha and h over r and stuff like that. Um, well, it turns out this process works well only for low mass planets, only for planets that are substantially lower mass than the typical super Earth pair. Can the disk turbulently knock them out? This is because the disk fluctuations don't care how massive your planet is, but the convergent migration rate becomes predominant more and more rapid as the, planet, the planets become more massive. So long story short, turbulence is not the answer. Okay? Turbulence does not knock you out of resonance if you are a super Earth. So if that's not true, then what is? Well, so this is, a, is not a blob. It is a image of a protoplanetary disk uh, by, taken by ALMA. Um, this is one of the more extreme ones, of course. But I think the thing that we can clearly see here is that disks are not exactly axisymmetric, right? This disk is cool because it's got spiral arms. But generically speaking, the disks have no obligation to you or me to be exact circles. So what if we lift the assumption that migration must happen on exactly circular orbits, right? What if we allow the eccentricities to, to have a few percent? That problem can be also solved analytically as a adiabatic uh, change problem of an integrable Hamiltonian. Effectively, that becomes a question of if the phase space area occupied by the trajectory is to start with greater than the area occupied by the homoclinic curve when it first appears in phase space, then the process of capture into resonance becomes not a certain one, but a probabilistic one. Okay? And you can write down a different equation, which is simple in that you can put it on a slide, has some information about planetary masses and planetary eccentricities as things convergently migrate. And if all this junk is less than or equal to six, then you're... <laughs> 100%, you're guaranteed to lock in resonance. But if it's greater than six, then the process of resonance capture becomes a fundamentally probabilistic one because you go through a hyperbolic fixed point. The moment you exceed six, which in here is labeled as three, because, uh, <laughs> you know, I divided by two, uh, <clears throat> right? Uh, then your probability of capture drops dramatically to about 20%. That's actually... That jives with the data much better. About 20% of uh, Kepler planets are actually in resonance. So what does that translate to in, in human language? So in human language, this means that if you take the masses of the known super-Earths and ask them, how eccentric must you have been to not lock in resonance? The answer is about 0 0.02. So if planets approach one another, with eccentricities of about 2%, which is not very much, then you drop the probability of capture into resonance from hundreds to about 20%. Okay? How does this compare with the data? The typical eccentricity of a Kepler planet is about 0 0.02. I didn't make this up. Okay? This is from uh, Haddon and Lithwick, 2014, right? their TTV analysis. So I think what's going on is simply that our expectation, right, our kind of making of disks axisymmetric in code led us to believe that everything must line up in resonance, but actually disks are slightly out of round, and that's enough to break that 100% certainty of planet uh, locking. So I think that uh, that's all that's going on. Thank you.
Absolutely. I think, yeah, in, you're absolutely right. I, I think actually that is the simplest way to excite eccentricity at that level. Now, disk, disk eccentricities are actually a little bit weird because you, um, you tend to excite the modes, right, rather than just kind of making the whole thing exactly lopsided. But that aside, all we're looking for is a couple percent, right? So I think it's completely reasonable that simply for, as a consequence of most stars being born multiple, disks will be slightly out of round. <laughs> yes? Where the half six, six. Ah, the six. <laughs> so this uh, oh my god, I'm so excited. Um, I, I think the, the really I, I think the answer is no. Um, so look, six, I will tell you exactly where six comes from. Okay? If you um, take this plot right here, okay, in, which is plotted in terms of P and Q, which doesn't matter what those are, um, and compute the area occupied by the, the curve that either looks like a heart or a butt, depending on your perspective, <laughs> then that area, okay, turns out to be 12 pi, okay? And 12 pi, 12 pi right? So you just scale, scale out the two pi, and that's where you get the six from. The six is is a, the six is a measure of how much phase space area the resonance has when it is born. Okay? So uh, the short answer to that question is, have I looked at something observationally? God, no. Okay? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not allowed to even touch telescopes. Uh, but um, here's why, here's why uh, it's difficult to do this exercise. When planets do capture into resonance, okay, if they migrate somewhat together, then the same conservation of this adiabatic invariance, this point here gets advected further and further along the x-axis, which means that their eccentricities together will grow in concert. Okay, so inside the resonance, there's additional dynamics that happens, which prevents you from just saying, if you're in resonance, you've got to be a circle. If you're out of resonance, you've got to have 2%. Right? There's, there's additional stuff that happens. That's what um, limits the... What I have looked at is, what are the eccentricities of the non-resonant objects? And that's about 0 0.02. Yeah, absolutely. It has a trend depending on planet mass, which can be uh, deduced quite readily uh, by looking at this expression. You plug in some, the eccentricities here. These Fs are of order unity. They don't change that much depending on what resonance you choose. Then you see this two-thirds power. Okay, So it goes roughly as M, the planet, the, the mass the total planetary mass over the stellar mass to the two-thirds power. It does depend on, on this, almost linearly. Another question from the back. Yes, James? Uh, I'm just curious, the disk dissipates over a time scale of about 10 million years. So the disk has a sort of diminishing drag effect as the planets are coming out of the disk. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious how crisp this prediction is or whether it can get kind of fuzzy if you have uh, effects from the disk early on. Yeah, well, much like... Uh, you know, so everything I do is fuzzy math. Uh, but the, the point here is actually that um, you acquire your eccentricity from the disk. Right? The planets just inherit their eccentricities from the disk. As you take the disk away, all you do is you change the time scale on which planets return to the disk eccentricity. 
right? So I think it is, it is sound. It's not a, it's not the case where as you take the disk away, things will later circularize. I think they will just continue to be ex slightly eccentric uh, forever, which is different, by the way, from the turbulent hypothesis. There, as you t take the disk away, the turbulence dies down faster than damping does, uh, just because of the way that diffusion works. So I think this, uh, this idea is completely bulletproof. There's no way that it could be wrong. Stop asking questions, James. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have, do we have a pointer or? Oh, there, oh yes, okay. Okay, yeah. So I'm gonna talk about a project that I feel is like really good for your soul. So, but, but definitely contrast with the, the, uh, the, the, the previous two talks. Um, and it also will contrast if, if this scares you off, it, it's like anti-correlated with the colloquium later. So, um, but, but I think it's very beautiful, so. And I'll try to convince you of that. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about cosmological perturbation theory and then um, and, and specializing to, to the case of 1D dynamics. I'll explain what that means. This was done in collaboration with Martin White. Um, and so, as you guys all know, we have this, like, the, this beautiful theory that explains the CMB very well, just with, with you know, six, six or so parameters. And this is all linear. Th the fluctuations in CMB are small, so you just write down lin linear equations and you solve them and... and Voila, it works beautifully. Um, but uh, things go nonlinear in our universe. This is why we exist. Um, and, and this makes perturbation theory harder. So, the, um, so, so and, and, I, um, and I would say that we haven't had as much success at, at explaining um, uh, the uh, cos cosmological structure at late times when we have nonlinear things when we have halos and galaxies to nearly the, the same degree as, as we have in the CMB. And so the, the standard approach for cosmological perturbation theory is you, uh, 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 is, is you essentially assume that the universe is a superfluid. It's a fluid that has no viscosity, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and no pressure. And then you, you solve at various orders in the, in the linear um, density fluctuations. The, the, um, for for uh, the, uh, you solve those equations at various orders, and, and those are your different or, uh, um, um, different order solutions to the to a hierarchy of solutions to the the problem. Um, and so this illustrates kind of the the success of doing this. Um, so so what is shown here is the matter power spectrum dividing by, divided by something that I'm not going to define. This is linear theory. The, the, the squares are a cosmological simulation. And then all of the other are various people's theories for a, a perturbation, the, uh, uh, higher order solutions to some to, to perturbation theory, where they're doing what I said. Although people have come up with various schemes for how to resum different terms in the expansions and make the expansion converge more quickly. But, but what I'd like to just point out is that kind of where linear theory deviates from the simulation, all of the other the solutions, these higher order solutions that should work better, are not are are deviating at at, at the same scale, and then and then, uh, and and then doing all sorts of different things. Um, eventually, we don't think that should work because the, the uh, at so, at a certain scale, this is wave number, then then things become nonlinear and non-perturbative in our universe. But there's, we should be able to ex explain some some range of scales better than linear theory with a higher order perturbation theory. Okay. And so this motivates our setup. So what we're doing is we're specializing in the case of 1D dynamics. Uh, and this has a lot of advantages. Uh, and so I'm going to go through the advantages. So what is 1D? So 1D is a bunch of sheets. 
So, and it's equivalent to taking all of the perturbation theories that people have written in the past and just saying all of my wave vectors point in the same direction. Uh, but then it's the same equations as, a, that, as everyone has been solving. And so because it's the same equations, and these sheets are moving in a Hubble flow, uh, because it's the same equations, there's making the same assumptions other than because we're 1D, often they also make an additional assumption that they throw out vorticity and we don't have to do that. So that's one advantage, uh, or, or, for, or one, one nice thing about I, 1D is it's still making these assumptions that the universe is a perfect fluid. The uh, second advantage is that Lagrangian perturbation theory, where, which is um, w where you're, you're solving for the displacements of, of, of these sheets or particles if it's in 3D, it, Lagrangian perturbation theory, if we're talking about sheets, so if we're in 1D, the potential doesn't change until sheets cross. And so this becomes a linear equation uh, th this doesn't change until, uh, so this is a linear equation until sheets cross, and so I can solve it exactly. And so the, and so, so you, it's, and so the, uh, the, until sheet crossing, Lagrangian perturbation theory uh, linear, uh, at linear order gives you the full solution, and then you can show that uh, Eulerian perturbation theory, if you, at, if you were able to sum all of the orders up, it would give you the L Lagrangian perturbation theory at linear order, and so you could solve for the exact solutions to all, uh, all previous perturbation theories that were on the, on the previous slide, and the exact solution in 1D is this. So, so I can solve for the infinite order of, of, of every perturbation theory on this, on this, on this and, and it's this expression. Um, and then the final advantage of 1D is it's really hard to compare your perturbation theory with, uh, with, uh, with actual cosmological simulations at the precision that we're doing cosmology. So we, we want our perturbation theory to be accurate at the percent level, but to get the percent level, you need, in 3D, humongous simulations. Uh, uh, the, for BAO scales, you need at least 10 to the 10 particles. And, but in 1D, you're, you're sampling scales in, in just a linear way, and so with 10 to the 7 particles, if I wanted to estimate a thousand the the, uh, the power spectrum in a thousand band powers, then I would have ten to the four samples in every band power, and that would give me a one percent measurement at every scale. Uh, so and uh, ten to seven particles is super easy. I can I can run a, a, that on my computer in five minutes. The, and so it allows you to test these perturbation theories much more easily. Um, and then I, I'll allude to this at the end of my talk that there there are just a striking number of similarities and analogies between uh, between one one and three D. I'm not going to say that one D is what the universe looks like. It's not, but there's a lot of a lot of the dynamics is still there. Um, and so so you can you can look at what one D looks like in certain cases. This is a Gaussian, uh, and this this is just a Gaussian gradient field. And I, I'm not going to get into the, to what this uh, uh, what what is depicted uh, here. Um, the okay, so here again, this is the matter power spectrum. So th this is um, the uh, uh, this is a, a way of quantifying fluctuations on different scales in our universe. And in one D, we're what we're doing in this uh, in this calculation is we're matching the dimensionless power spectrum of our universe, the, in, uh, uh, which means that this, on, er on every given scale in our one D um, universe, it, ha this, it has the same amplitude of fluctuations. Um, and so the the dashed curve here is uh, is linear theory, the the black is a is a simulation, um, and so that's that's the the correct solution. The the blue is is the infinite order of all of these perturbation theories, and then the the red is is uh, going to fourth order in this what's the standard perturbation theory everyone uses, which is called which people call standard perturbation theory. So. And then this is going to sixth order in standard perturbation theory. This is just kind of cute. Uh, I, 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 like, I like that I can do this. And then you can go to 10th. No, no one goes to sixth. Or maybe they go to sixth, sixth. They never go to 10th. You can go to 20th. You can go to 40th. And then it converges to this infinite order solution. But the infinite order solution just does it. It's is terrible. Like it, 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 um, it, it, it's departing from, from the, 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 the expectation from the simulation, even though the fluctuations are, much, uh, are, are, are smaller than one. Um, and so then there's this really neat idea that has come around in the last few years that, that um, Matthias Zardiaga, Dan Bauman, when they were here, I think were starting to develop, and, and, and they finished this off when they went to the IAS. But the, so these perturbation theories are making an onsatz for what the, uh, how the small-scale universe behaves. It's this perfect fluid. Um, 
but really you should put in terms that that uh, are not nearly realized but that are that should be there just because of the symmetries in the universe and so you just and these are called effective theories so just based on like simple symmetry arguments you could say that there should be other terms that are that these perturbation theories are missing that um, that it makes it the universe the really you should be solving an imperfect fluid you shouldn't not as rather than a superfluid um, and uh, okay, so to sum up, the, you, as I said, you can test in one D to a much better degree, like how these theories are working, than in three D. Or at least you can run with, with uh, by a better degree. I mean, with far fewer CPU hours. Um, the uh, and in fact, in three D, almost always people just test like very close to our current cosmology. But these are just cosmologies with different power law density fluctuations. So these are scale invariant. Cosmologies, um, and if you look at our paper, we look at a bunch of even other cosmologies beyond this. And so the uh, the the um, the black is the infinite order solution of the standard perturbation theories. The dash blue is a, is a simulation, and then the green is are these effective theories. And like and what you should note, like the residuals are shown for these different. The, 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 this power law has much more power in the UV than this one. That uh, that at uh, at, 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 so at scales where linear theory starts to break down, which is uh, the red curve is linear theory, the, the, all of the all of this old uh, perturbation theories are also breaking down. But these effective theories are really adding the term that they that you need to add to to, to do to, to for this the the perturbation theory to be working to to higher k so to smaller scales. Um, okay, and then just the last cute thing is, is that uh, uh, that you. The, the, so a, a lot of our paper also just talks about a many, a many of the effects that there's been a huge literature on in perturbation theory in 1D. And in 1D, you could just write, 1D is really easy. You have far fewer intervals, and so you can write down these effects and, and expressions that are just much simpler. And, and so the, in the end, I think, if, like if you, if you wanted to learn perturbation theory, the cosmological perturbation theory, um, the... The, our, 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 our paper ended up being like this really kind of cute review of like all of these different effects that people have have uh, written you know, hundreds of papers on that you could just in very, in very simple terms write down like what that effect looks like in 1D, which isn't the universe, but, but for learning what's going on, I think is nice. All right, and so that's all I have to say. Yeah, that's right. Because it does describe the nonlinear regime quite well. Uh, the top hat model is used to describe galaxy terrors, and that can be important to simulate. Yeah. Yeah, one D spherical. The only problem is you've got get, gotten rid of your translational invariants, and so then the you're you're kind of working on the theory of the collapse of something at that point. That that's what spherical collapse is, or or the if you're talking about, about a void, the expansion of that. And the, but it, for spherical symmetry, you can do it exactly. Okay, or but and so I think the translational invariance, which we're very used to in cosmology, which um, makes it so every mode doesn't correlate. The, um, the except with its with itself is uh, is something that um, you would lose and 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 and, and uh, we actually did consider that doing this um, Avi but because of that I, I think it, you're doing you're doing a theory of something different the, it's it, it, uh, and 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 the analogies with these perturbation theories will be a little bit less clear. All right, can you hear me? All right, good. Hi, so I'm Shirin, uh, and I'll be talking about a recent paper that I submitted that got recently accepted uh, by Martin Weinberg. Uh, 
it's on the archive, and it's work that I've done with uh, some collaborators at MPA, uh, Gortina Besta, who used to be here a while ago, and, uh, and Catherine Johnston, and one of the students. Um, so I'll be talking about the vertical structure of the disk, and today actually I'll be mostly focusing on the view that we have from a, the H1 view of the galactic disk. Tomorrow I'll be talking a little bit more about how to put this all together in context with the stellar view, but for the sake of today I'll just focus on just one particular topic. And so this map effectively is a 2D map that shows you the, the variation in height of the galactic disk in H1, so it's seen through the 21 centimeter line, and you can see that there are variations in height uh, that vary from minus one kiloparsec all the way up to even six kiloparsec in the outermost regions of the uh, galactic disk. And this is a map that was done in 2006. There's been other maps to trying to revise this view, but nothing really changed much. And what's interesting to see is that there is basically the line of node in the in the galactic. So effectively, you see that there's a galactic warp where basically material is below the, the midplane and higher than the midplane, and the lines of nodes seem, seem to coincide from where the sun is to the galactic center, so kind of uh, nice perpendicular. And so when you actually try to quantify this a little bit more, um, through concentric rings as a function of radius, so this, these are shown by these two panels. This is a ring that's taken at 22 kiloparsec galactocentric and 16 kiloparsec. You can see that effectively the H1 the H1 warp, so that is the, the mean height above the midplane, can be parameterized actually through the linear combination of roughly three uh, Fourier uh, components in the Fourier series, and so this is shown here. And you can see that effectively the the warp is symmetrical about the midplane. Okay, generally basically sticking out much more uh, towards uh, towards the north, and um, and Effectively, the, you know, yeah, it kind of looks like a sinusoid with, you know, some kind of a modulation uh, that basically changes uh, the width of the sinusoid. And <clears throat> now there are different there are different theories and scenarios for the for the formation of warps in galaxies, but particularly to the Milky Way, we know that our Milky Way is surrounded by uh, companions that are quite massive that are known to have dark matter halos around them. And so, you know, the, one of the one of the the preferred scenarios to explain basically the origin of the warp is through basically the satellite halo interactions, so tidal interactions, but also the interactions uh, that are due to basically the response of the host, so the response of the Milky Way dark matter halo to the orbit of infalling satellites. And this is actually quite old, um, and it's, it all derives actually from dynamical friction, and that was basically uh, first first looked at in a series of papers by Martin Weinberg in, in, the, in, the, in the late 80s. And this, this, uh, this illustration basically is quite nice from a paper from 98, um, where he effectively tried to calculate uh, the response of a galactic disk to an infalling satellite. And as the satellite falls and basically uh, orbits around the Milky Way, it actually excites basically a dark matter ha a halo wake in, in the midplane of the disk. And so this is actually illustrated here through these dipole moments where you see regions of over-density and under-densities. And as the satellite orbits around the galaxy, basically these dipoles also change in phase. And so this actually affects the disk in order to basically lift it up. And so you can see that it basically tumbles up and down. Now, just to go back now to the case of our Milky Way, which is what I'm interested in, basically we have different suspects. First one are very obvious ones. There are the Magellanic clouds here, as you can see. And then the other one that you don't really see in this picture, but I tried to basically match the two, um, is basically the smaller galaxy, the uh, Sagittarius dwarf galaxy, um, which was more massive in the past, but today seems to have only 1% of its mass bound. So today I'll be talking mostly about the LMC because they're, they're quite, I mean, the, the LMC is particularly interesting because there's been some revised proper motions that, and models that suggest that basically from these proper motions, um, first and four orbits may be, may be favored. And so it is actually interesting to ask the question whether actually, you know, if, if the LMC was more massive in the past and that it's just, you know, um, just past its first pericenter, can it actually have an effect on the, on the galactic disk and basically the, the warp of the Milky Way? And this is basically what I set out to do in this paper where we looked at six different models for, uh, oops, how does this work? 
Yeah, okay, six different models for the LMC on a first info orbit. <coughs> they are shown in this panel here on the YZ plane. And basically, the different colored solid lines represent the models for different uh, LMC progenitor uh, mass models at info. So, the, you know, from the, from, the, from the Vero radius, so basically the, the LMC comes in from 200, 200, 300 kiloparsec away and to reach basically its present day position. And this little diamond here shows the, the, the point of closest approach. And so the mass spans from 3 times 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is black, black line, all the way up to 2.5 times 10 to 11 solar masses, which is the red line. And <coughs> we made sure that, that we had an accurate represent, or at least uh, a fairly accurate representation of what we know about the LMC, <laughs> the Milky Way. This is shown here in this, in this panel, where basically we try to make sure that the LMC is modeled such that the mass within the optical radius fits um, the observational constraints that we have, and then here basically varying the virial masses. And this plot here is basically showing you the circular velocity curve for the Milky Way model that we used, <coughs> divided by different components, basically the total component here. And <coughs> so the mass of our Milky Way has a mass of 10 to the 12, uh, stellar disk that's 6.5 times 10 to the 10. You know, it's, it's a little, slight, slightly massive. You know, other, other studies suggest that there is maybe 6 or 5.5 times 10 to the 10, but that doesn't seem to matter. We tried different models. Um, the scale length is a little bit large, but this was actually in order to be able to include uh, the thin and the thick disk together. So, so don't get alarmed by the fact that this is quite big. This is trying to basically try to make a fiducial mass model for both disks. Um, and we also looked at basically the, the gas, but effectively the gas just responds the same as the, as the stars. Okay, so on to with the results. <coughs> These different panels basically show you the mean vertical height about the disk. Um, so it basically varies from minus one to <laughs> one kilo parsec. And <laughs> these are 2D maps. And you can see basically the, the little started circle. No, it's fine. It's just that I have, I have this, yeah, thanks. I just have this condition that when I, whenever I get a cold, I get a cough for another six months during the year. <laughs> thanks to the NHS um, in the UK. Um, anyway, so the sun is supposed to be here um, at, at 8 kiloparsec, and basically these, these variation, there's a variation in the response of, of, of these different models, as expected for the most massive model, the t two times, 2.5 times 10 to 11 solar mass model uh, excites a much stronger warp. And then basically we can compare this to the H1 data, where the distances are, just to remind everyone, they're derived, they're kinematical distances, okay? So they should be taken with a pinch of salt, um, because when you look and compare the, the models that we have, we, we don't have actually such a, a good of a match. However, there are certain things that should be noted that are actually interesting. First of all is <clears throat> we get <laughs> the, the correct phase, at least in the signal of the war. So that's one, that's kind of good. Previous embodied simulation models did not seem to get that right. So that's that's good. Second, anti-symmetrical shape of, of, of the warp, same as the observations. All right, roughly roughly consistent. Again, no higher modes. You know, you can actually describe this by superposition of three uh, Fourier series, so that's good. The only problem is that there's a discrepancy, it seems here, at you know, 22 kiloparsec, or basically a discrepancy of, of almost a factor of two. Now note, again, that I said there are kinematically inferred distances for these H1 points you know, that are, seem to be also uncertain by a factor of two. So maybe this is, this is not so bad after all. <coughs> now you might ask me, oh, 2.5 times 10 to the 11, that's, that's quite high for a mass of the, of the LMC. You know, it's, it goes against conventional wisdom. Uh, but actually, you know, 2.5 solar masses is, seems to be quite in line with other dynamical uh, mass measurement techniques, such as, for example, the timing argument that was used by Jorge Peña Rubia where they show effectively uh, the posterior probability. And you can see that the LMC seems to be suggest, you know, suggests that basically 2.5 times 10 to 11 is actually favored. Um, however, if you look at basically the maximum, sorry, just go back. If you look at the, basically the maximum height of the warp at a given radius, whether it's this panel or this one, you can see that there's actually a quite a linear relation that follows from maximum height of the warp as a function of uh, progenitor mass of the LMC. And so if you actually believe that there is such a relation, in order to get basically reach heights of two kiloparsecs above the midplane, you know, you could go for 3.5 times 10 to 11, and it seems to be in line. 
There are other things that we can also think about, which is basically a higher mass for the, for the halo of the Milky Way, which would lead to a longer time spent by the LMC uh, in its orbit to complete its orbit, and this would also basically boost also the signal. And there's also other things such as basically that we need to take into account, like these kinematically inferred distances that seem to have be on certain by a factor of two. And if you look at the effect of Sagittarius, you can see that it might also have a significant effect of similar, roughly similar amplitude. This is shown by, by this dashed line. And so I'll end up my talk here by saying that effectively the revised uh, upward mass model of the LMC seem to uh, show that there is actually, that it is still capable to produce a warp in the disk. There are some discrepancies that remain. This might be due simply to observational biases or perhaps you know, the omission of um, the modeling of Sagittarius. And so basically at this point, um, um, I can say that basically the Milky Way is most likely currently being shaped by both the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Sagittarius Dwarf. And I'll take questions. Yeah, so, um, no, I have not actually checked that. Uh, that's an interesting question to look at. Um, what it could mean also is that, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps it's not clear whether, I mean, no, yeah, no, I haven't looked at that. Uh, but it's interesting to look at. Um, not really. I haven't actually seen anyone like just show any information, at least with uh, with respect to sort of radial velocity. That's something that I mean, if I could fetch, I could look at and compare. Um, so, uh, but however, I mean, there should be. <laughs> there's, you know, you, you can basically make uh, predictions for you know what you would see basically in the stars, at least in terms of proper motion on the on the sky, and that's uh, that's something that I'm doing as part of the guy sprint thing. Uh, that happened basically a week ago in uh, New York. Um, Any comments on the not really, because there's not really anything to compare to at the moment, um, and I need to contact Sergey about this, who derived proper motion maps. But. Sure, but I mean, you could, you could, you know, you could argue that actually by including, uh, you know, the LMC and and you know, uh, actually the effect of the LMC would be just like you know the triaxiality, right? Because you just have these two big halos, so we account to the same thing, I think. But yeah, it's obvious that the halo of the Milky Way is most likely triaxial. Um, but uh, but I mean, yeah, when you, when you look at sort of uh, cosmological and body simulations of how warps generally form. Uh, it's not so much, so much basically the, the triaxiality of the halo that really affects the shape of the of the warp, but it's it generally seems to be the case that it's the wake that's actually excited by inflowing satellites that regenerates the, the warp. You can sometimes also create warps by um, by infall, by misaligned infall. Uh, that's also another way of, of creating them. But the halo triaxiality does not play such a big role compared to um, the wake that basically can be imparted on them. All right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yo. Oh, it's sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's